So finally, I got around to, or feel well enough to post these next few lecture series, one on psychoanalysis, uh, which we covered two weeks ago now, and uh, I apologize for not getting these up sooner, and also on close reading. Um, hopefully I'll be able to post both of those series today. Um, hopefully I'll have the energy to do it. Uh, and to, then tomorrow we can move on to talk about feminism, and hopefully I'll, I'll post um, some supplemental video lectures on feminism, maybe on Wednesday. We'll We'll, we'll really have to see. Um, I apologize for my for my Blue's Clues hoodie, but uh, <laughs> I am uh, still at the tail end of whatever uh, uh, put put me out of commission for over a week last week. So um, just trying to stay warm in my little um, uh, 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 study, as it were. Okay, so let's get to it. On the first day of class, I explained that each of the various types of criticism we would be studying might best be understood, less as a method and more as a cluster of concerns, problems, ideas, concepts, and models, many of which may actually compete or conflict with one another. This distinction is particularly important now as we move into our later approaches to the study of literature. Psychoanalysis, after all, is a clinical practice, a mode of therapy for the mentally ill and the healthy mind alike. Indeed, one of the, one of the insights of psychoanalysis is that the mentally ill and, or the quote, abnormal mind and the normal mind uh, are really not so much different in kind as in degree or intensity. What draws literary critics to psychoanalysis is a complicated issue. Uh, but we can begin to grasp or get a grasp on this issue simply by trying to get a grasp on the basic insights of Sigmund Freud. Freud may be the most famous or infamous figure we cover this semester. While theorists like Jacques Derrida or, and excuse me, Michel Foucault, who we'll talk about later in this semester, are renowned in academia and in a few non-academic fields as well, Freud's influence expands beyond the realm of the academic, or the specialist and into the popular. When I have asked students in the past how many of them had heard of Freud before taking my courses, nearly every student raised his or her hand, and that happened two weeks ago as well. When I asked the same question about Derrida or Foucault, the number always drops dramatically to maybe about two or three hands, right? And often these are students who've taken my courses before, so it doesn't really count. How much this matters to our understanding of literary critics' interest in psychoanalysis will depend on how much we actually understand Freud's insights. It always pained me to reduce his oeuvre to a few bullet points. After all, his work stretches over five decades. Five decades. Some of it is speculative, some self-corrective, some uh, purportedly empirical, some super fun, some super frustrating, all of it interesting. Sticking with the pieces, um, or the points rather, that Parker emphasizes, I want to cover just, uh, just four things. The first is the unconscious. Remember, Freud's fundamental insight is that we are not really in control of our own thoughts and desires. That there's a whole structure of our lives and our minds of which we are wholly unaware and to which even trained analysts and clinicians have only partial and indirect access. This part of our mind is not available to our powers of introspection, though it is a determining agent in how we think, love, negotiate, react, work, have pleasure, understand pain, and so on. It is an ongoing process, automatic. The unconscious is always at work. To treat individuals whose neuroses have hindered their ability to participate normally in society, psychoanalysis offers a model according to which a clinician might be able to alter the ways in which the patient's unconscious does its work. Though Freud's model 
excuse me, though Freud revised his models of the unconscious several times during his life, his most famous model is the tripartite ego id superego model. All three of these terms refer to operations of the unconscious, though we may become partially aware of the ego and the superego's work. The id refers to primal drives and desires, the impulses to feed, flee, fl uh, uh, fight, excuse me, and, um, and also, forgive my language, to fuck. The ego refers to the mediating part of the unconscious, that selects which drives one, uh, one might choose to act upon. The ego, in short, is that part of the unconscious that selects whether or not I act upon my need to eat or drink. In certain situations, it might be inappropriate to do so. For example, if the food is not mine, if food is scarce and someone else might be in more need of it than me, etc. This is where the superego comes in as well. It constitutes a learned conscience. Again, a learned, not a moral, not really a moral conscience, but a learned conscience, according to which the ego acts or fails to act. In most normal people, normal people, these three operations, the id, ego, and superego, uh, work simultaneously in a relatively smooth way. For neurotics and psychotics, however, this whole mechanism is thrown out of balance. And so you get a weak superego, or a strong id, or a confused ego, right? People who do things that others consider to be bad, right, or inappropriate, um, and yet they feel no um, embarrassment about it. Um, they do what their drives want. So that's the first thing, the unconscious. Um, the second is uh, the processes of repression and sublimation. What kind of work does the unconscious do? How does the ego work? Let's look at what Parker has to say. So Parker, again, remember, is the author of our textbook. If you turn to 115, page 115, he writes uh, under the bullet point number two, repression drives and defenses. When we feel threatened by our drives, we often defend against them and repress them. That generates the unconscious, which consists of repressed drives. Freud argued that ex excess, excuse me, excess rep repression of psychological drives leads to neurosis. But contrary to many common misunderstandings, Freud did not see repression as inevitably a bad thing. If not for a repression, we would all be having sex with each other and killing each other. Therefore, we need repression. While some repressions can hurt us psychically, in many ways we also thrive on repression. We sublimate, sublimate repressed drives, meaning that we redirect them to other activities, which is how we build culture and civilization. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, the whole process of repression and sublimation is much more complicated than this. Um, sorry, I just passed the piece of paper for the camera. Is much more complicated than this in Freud's work, depending on whether or not he's theorizing mourning, mourning and melancholia, the pleasure and reality principles, the interpretation of dreams, the development of sexuality, or the underlying meaning of fetishes. The crux of the mechanisms Freud could reconstruct in order to explain and clinically intervene in these mind and body phenomena is repression and sublimation. When my ego needs to hold the, the drives at bay, or undergoes something traumatic, it represses the drives or the experience itself, funneling that energy into some other kind of behavior, desire, relationship, fetish, or neurosis. In this sense, Freud's in insight implies that extreme neurotics are not exceptions to normal people, but exaggerated or distorted versions of the necessar necessary and unconscious processes that rule all our, of our desires, behaviors, pleasures, and pains, many of which we have because of repression. Okay? They are sublimations of repressed drives, or effects of sublimation. Third thing I want to talk about, sexuality and gender. The most famous model of repression that Freud develops is without a doubt the Oedipus complex. Let's read the relevant passage from Parker. So this would be page 119. Okay. <clears throat> 
Freud's story of masculinity or, or male sexuality takes one path for infant boys and another for infant girls. Writing from the sexist presumptions shared by most men in his time and place, Freud took his story of, of boys as the foundation of his thinking. He turned to the ancient Greek story of Oedipus, familiar to many readers through Sophocles' play Oedipus Rex, to describe the path of gendering for boys. Through a fateful series of events, Oedipus, without realizing what he is doing, kills his father and marries his mother. In Freud's model, the infant boy feels an attraction to his mother. That much might be, of no, might be no surprise. But Freud extended that story from there. He saw the boy as beginning to look at the father as a rival for the mother, and thus as feeling an unconscious desire to kill the father, so as to have the mother to himself. Moreover, the boy observes that the mother has no penis, and he supposes, still unconsciously, that the mother has been castrated. He fears, therefore, that he too might be castrated, and more specifically, he fears that the father might castrate him for desiring his mother, or the mother. That is what Freud calls castration anxiety. Meanwhile, the erotic desire for the mother, the desire to kill the father, and castration anxiety all represent forbidden emotions that must be repressed. In repressed form, these forbidden desires stay alive, but only in the unconscious. The father's threat of castration, Freud believed, produces what Freud called the superego. I talked about that before, which we can describe as conscience, authority, and law. Um, and then skip to the next paragraph. Typically, the boy seeks to win his mother's love by identifying with his father. Identifying with his father helps the boy defend against the desire to kill his father because it denies and represses such desire. Through identifying with his father, then, a typical boy grows into adulthood as a heterosexual. As an adult, he displaces his desire for his mother onto a gender-similar object, a woman who is not his mother, and he lives his adulthood heterosexually. But if the boy fails to defend against his desire uh, for the mother by identifying with the father, then he can identify with the mother and grow into adulthood as a homosexual. Working from this model, Freud sees adult neuroses as deriving from early childhood traumas that interfere with the child's psychic development, right? The normal repression that enables him to get out of the Oedipus complex. The child's development can stall at the oral, anal, or Oedipal stage, or it can move on partly, but still have trouble growing completely out of those stages. And in what Freud called the return of the repressed, repressed drives can pop back up in the form of neurotic symptoms, disguised representations of unconscious desires. Indeed, he observed neurotics repeat the same symptoms over and over again, a pattern that Freud called repetition compulsion. Through analysis, he believed people could work through their neuroses, coming to a more comfortable sense, or at least a less uncomfortable sense, of how to live with emotions that may have taken a troubling form, but at their root are ordinary and do not need to offer an obstacle to well-adjusted adulthood. Okay. As unnerving as this model of male sexuality or gender may appear, and as frustrating as it may be to those who have uh, 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 later developed uh, maybe more empirically accurate models of how sexuality develops, there are some important implications. For Freud, sexuality is not something essential to an individual. There is no single natural masculinity or femininity, no single way to naturally be a sexed or sexual creature in the world. Rather, normal gender and or sexuality is a cultural effect or product of a common and primary episode of repression uh, that we all undergo in one way or another by virtue of the fact that we are each born and hopefully nurtured in culturally specific yet again still rather common ways. My gender and or sexuality, in other words, is developed in accordance with codes and conventions and with the psychical processes of repression and sublimation. I must, if I am to be a normal or healthy member of society, repress my desire for my mother, as well as my subsequent hatred of my father, 
as sexual rival um, in order to sublimate that desire and that hatred and the fear of my castration into any number of fetishes, behaviors, sexual relationships, occupations, friendships, hobbies, etc. This disjunction between gender or sexuality as an essence and as a cultural construct will be crucial in later episodes of this course, and also draws us back to structuralism and deconstruction. Just as there is no natural or essential way to tell a story, but a multiplicity of codes, conventions, and genres that enable us to recognize, enjoy, or dismiss the many narratives that we encounter in our lives, for Freud there is no natural or essential way to be a gendered, sexed, or sexualized human being. One should note, though, that he did think there was a normal way to be gendered, sexed, or sexualized, and that it uh, was definitely preferable to be normal than abnormal. So why should this matter to literary critics? Why should the possibility that gender and or sexuality is constructed over time and in accordance with naturalized codes and conventions matter to the way we read narratives, poems, plays, and so on? And here I come to my fourth point, namely the importance of narrative and interpretation. Here we come back to the important idea that psychoanalysis is not just a clinical practice or set of practices, but a cluster of concepts, concerns, ideas, emphases, perspectives, and problems. If gender and or sexuality is constructed over time, and if Freud models this construction according to literary or narrative models, then it follows that psychoanalysis might enable one to read narratives, or certain narratives, with an eye to the sexual, psychical development of its characters, its cultures, or even its author. If we have access to, especially if we have access to earlier drafts or biographical material. More than this, excuse me, we might say that what draws literary critics to a project like this, and to psychoanalysis in general, is that it resembles a mode of reading, of attending to signs and figures that refer not, to, not only to obvious things in the world, but to hidden meanings, subtler significations, latent contents that subsist and are still at work beneath manifest material at hand. As a method of articulating significant matters to which one does not have easy or immediate access, literary critics see several possible analogies between the psychoanalysis of a patient and the critical reading of a literary text, its author, and or its readers. Psychoanalytic literary criticism pays attention, inspired by Freud's notion of repression and sublimation, to that which is present and to that which is excluded or evaded, that which is emphasized, emphasized as, as a potential symptom of things that are hidden, veiled, and important because they are absent, underemphasized, or protested a bit too much. In the next video, I want to turn to Elizabeth Abel's book chapter on Mrs. Dalloway and try to flesh out the ways in which psychoanalysis is at work in that book chapter, um, the book chapter so that we can really uh, get a ri rigorous grasp and understanding of, of, of how it can be a fruitful, a fruitful resource um, for, for mining how uh, meaning is operate how um, meaning is operate. You can tell I'm still getting better. How um, meaning is operating in um, in a text as dense and complicated as Mrs. Dalloway. Okay, I'll be back.